Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to get started right at noon. I'm just letting people go ahead and sign in. As soon as I say that, it turns noon. <laughs> Look at that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Danielle Angelari, and I'm the executive director of NAMI Northern Illinois, which is an affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, we're serving Winnebago, Boone, Stevenson, and Joe Davies counties. Um, for those of you who don't really know what NAMI is, we are the nation's largest grassroots mental health advocacy organization dedicated to building better lives for people touched by mental illness. And we do that through support, education, advocacy, and providing hope to all those that reach out and find us. Um, I just wanted to start with a few updates and say thank you to everyone that was able to participate with us for our mental health month events as well as our annual fundraiser, uh, Mulligans for Mental Illness at Forest Hills this past couple weeks ago. Um, just wanna say we appreciate you and we look forward to doing more with you again next year for both of those things. And then just the one other announcement I want to make is that we have one more leading the conversation next Tuesday at noon with Tavares Moore, who is a licensed clinical social worker. And he's gonna talk to us about understanding work-life balance. And I can absolutely send that link out to you after this presentation. But for today, I would like to introduce you to Carol Erickson. Ms. Erickson believes that healthy food should be accessible, affordable, and plentiful to all people. Where you live should not determine the quality or availability of healthy food. Carol has spent her adult life working with limited income families to improve their lives by making healthy choices. Ms. Erickson has worked as the WIC nutritionist for the state of Missouri, as director of health education at Ogle County Health Department, and as a SNAP Ed Extension educator for University of Illinois Extension in Winnebago County. At Illinois Community College, she taught child nutrition. Ms. Erickson earned her Bachelor of Arts at Augustana College in elementary education, studied nutrition at Western Illinois University, and earned her Master of Education degree in adult and higher education at Northern Illinois University. Through community engagement and collaboration, Carol is working on making environmental changes that make choosing healthy food an easy option. Carol, thank you so much for doing this today, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to come today and talk. Uh, let's see, is that showing up yet? Yeah, it is. Can you see my screen? Yep, Danielle? looks good. Yep. Perfect. So thank you for letting me come. Um, I'm sharing a presentation that I have done a couple times with uh, uh, at another conference and um, University of Illinois Extension uh, sponsors a conference every year called Hunger and Health. And we do one in Northern Illinois and one in uh, Central Illinois. So this is um, adapted version of that. And as Daniel said, I work for University of Illinois Extension and I'm funded through SNAP Education. So just a little background, um, USDA through the SNAP Education Program, SNAP Program um, budgets a little bit of money to do education. And so in Illinois, it's uh, through University of Illinois Extension and uh, some of my coworkers, coworkers do direct education, uh, working in the community on um, teaching classes on how to eat healthy, be more active and save money. Our motto you can see at the bottom is eat, move, save. So um, that's a little background. Um, this presentation was originally written for food pantries. So you're gonna hear a little bit of this and you may, um, some of this may be review. I'm sure it will be on the trauma, but I'm gonna take the spin of the perspective of food insecurity. So that will run through this. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the um, trauma-informed way that we can address food insecurity um, and how we're working on that in uh, Northern Illinois. So here's a couple objectives for us today. I'm going to uh, define trauma um, and talk about what trauma-informed nutrition security is, um, talk a little bit about key points of food dignity, and then some customer service strategies to help um, promote food dignity. So to set the stage, 
uh, in 2021, the stats from 2021, we know what happened in that year. Um, it was documented through Feeding America that 53 million Americans received food assistance um, from some type of charitable sector in that year. And we know during that year, um, when COVID hit, some families were told to go home and didn't receive a food check. Uh, some essential workers were out there hitting, had to go to work every day. Um, uh, so we know there are a lot of things that happened during that year that impacted um, food insecurity. It's interesting though, um, that number is actually, was down from the year before, which was up closer to 60,000. So you would, would have thought that uh, COVID would have driven it higher, but it actually was lower. And um, some of you remember um, families received, uh, if their children were in school, they received some um, SNAP ed or SNAP um, dollars that they could use. So, you know, I, maybe more people were going and maybe less were going um, during those years or during that year. So I'm going to briefly talk about what trauma is. And I, I know this is a field that many of you are working on. So um, hopefully this isn't too much of a review for you, but uh, trauma is a result of an event or a series of events or some circumstances that um, may impact somebody physically or emotionally, and uh, it affects how we, um, it affects the whole person, and um, it affects everybody at all ages. It's not um, just uh, as adults, but it, uh, as you'll see in the next slide that it um, what happens during childhood has great impact on them. Um, but I also like to say that trauma um, affects us all differently. So there could be four children in a family, like in my family, and something could have happened and it affected one person more than another. So we have to, um, you know, trauma is a very individual thing. Uh, ACEs is a term um, I became aware of probably about um, three, four years ago. And um, this term actually, besides just saying adverse childhood experiences, it also includes the community in that <clears throat> definition or that term. Uh, but the concept of ACEs is that there are things, there are trauma, stresses that happen during childhood and it's um, things that have happened up to like the age of 18 that have caused stress to this person to a child. And there are like 10, there's a, uh, an exam, a test out there, a questionnaire. Uh, we're not going to go into that today, but like there are 10 different um, events, uh, experiences that a child can go through. And the more of those that you, you can say yes to, the more... Um, the more it impacts your overall health, your mental health, your physical health. Um, it could be within families, it could be in a, within a community. We'll see in the next slide a little bit about that. But uh, CDC did a survey um, a few years back and it found that, and it was among 23 different states and it said that, or they found that like 62% of the adult population has had some type, uh, have, have experienced at least one um, uh, adverse childhood experience in their, in their childhood. So uh, it does impact a lot of us and, um, and we're learning more about it all the time. So uh, I mentioned, I think a lot of times we think of um, trauma happening within the family. And I think the questionnaire, questionnaire that's out there often addresses those fa the family environment. Uh, and you can see what some of those are um, that are listed up there, divorce, homelessness, uh, mental illness, um, drug abuse, including alcoholism, um, domestic violence, maternal depression, 
uh, neglect, physical neglect, neglect, um, if a family member was incarcerated. Those are some things within the family household. But there's other areas that sometimes um, maybe we don't always think about, and that could be within your community. Um, there are a lot of those li listed there. Um, but then the environment is another area that I think often is addre isn't addressed. And, and you know, I mentioned the pandemic or uh, COVID, how you know that had some impact on food insecurity. But um, you think about uh, a tornado hitting uh, Oklahoma, uh, that has great impact. That's a trauma that affects somebody. Um, I'm not sure. I know um, the smoke coming down from Canada it may have some impact. Oh, it may affect the breathing piece. So somebody can't get outside and exercise, whatever. So we know um, household, community, and the environment can impact um, adverse experiences that we have, especially as children and as adults. Some other things that they found out about um, the adverse experiences uh, during childhood, um, women and um, different racial groups are at greater risk of having at least four or more ACEs. And then food insecure families um, often experience uh, multiple um, forms of trauma. And uh, as you might think, um, when you add, start adding multiple um, uh, incidents of trauma up, it does have an impact on our health. And the research has shown that um, the six things that are listed here, liver disease, severe obesity, or even just being overweight, heart disease, diabetes, uh, cancer and chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease can be impacted by um, having multiple stress uh, trauma in your life. So we, I have the picture of the iceberg up here. And um, when we're working with families, a lot of times we see the the face of the person that walks through. We might hear a few of the stories, but uh, deep down, there's a lot of other things going on in that person, uh, their values, their beliefs, um, how they grew up, um, their environment, their culture, their health, um, what was valued in their family. So um, as I was working with, uh, as I was teaching this to food pantry staff, um, I wanted them to think, you know, we see and we hear only what's reported to us, but a lot of times there's a lot more going on um, that um, sometimes buried. And um, obviously people don't wanna share everything when they come in uh, for visits um, to a food pantry and, and they only tell what they need to tell. So I, this is just a reminder for anybody working um, with food insecure people. There's a lot of other, could be a lot of other things going on. Uh, here's some examples of what um, food-related um, trauma might look like. So um, the obvious one is uh, not having enough food, um, or maybe the food that's available is unreliable or unpredictable. Uh, meal times might not be um, might not be consistent, and so you know when children go to school they know they're gonna get breakfast and lunch at a certain time, but at home that might not be happening. Um, parent may be working, there may be other things going on. And so um, food may be unpredictable. Um, in some cases, there may be restriction or control on over food. Uh, sometimes I've seen this in um, families that had were in foster care situations uh, where there might've been some restrictions and that's, um, uh, or may, maybe it's a, a parent um, overly concerned about a child's um, weight. And, um, and that's uh, kind of leads into that body shaming piece. Sometimes that um, children have experienced that at a younger age. And it's not just being overweight, but it could be um, small. It could be um, whatever, you know, it's just body shaming. Um, 
loss of food traditions. And I, uh, I was thinking about this the other day that um, as um, I'm thinking specifically about immigrants who have come to the United States and have tried to acclimate to the American lifestyle, they may have lost um, some of their family traditions that they had had uh, where they were. So um, losing something that was really important to them or de-emphasizing that um, could be um, stressful to them. Uh, we all know that food is used for manipulation and um, with, sometimes it's withheld, withheld because as a form of punishment and or we use it as a reward. And um, we don't intend bad when we do that, but it, I think it's just natural. Uh, we do that to ourselves, um, and sometimes we do it to children. And I think back to um, when I was a kid and you'd go to the doctor's office, and you were always rewarded um, after you got your shot with um, something sweet like a sucker. So like, so some of this happens um, unintentionally but it does affect um, uh, your uh, experience and shapes who we are. Sometimes shame, bias, and stigmas um, attach to accepting, uh, going and getting food and, um, you know, not, not that um, many of us are doing that, but sometimes people feel that. And if you think about a child, um, go back to school lunch in the old days, uh, when school lunch, your parents signed you up for free or reduced lunch, you had a different, um, sometimes you had a different card and your peers would know about it, that you were getting free. So there might've been some stigma there uh, going back. Um, I think nowadays schools have worked really hard to get rid of that. So they don't, other students don't know if you're getting free or reduced lunches. If you're in the Rockford area, all children get free lunch, so that's not uh, an issue anymore um, for free lunches. And then um, the last one I have there is just the um, inadequate um, support for food. And that may be, um, you know, just not having enough or um, it's not reliable. So these are just some examples of how um, uh, adverse um, uh, childhood trauma related to food. And um, if any of you have ever worked with uh, families that had um, children in uh, foster care, uh, I would see some of this um, that um, especially when they weren't sure where they were going to get food again, they would, well, they might hide food. And then we'll talk about that in a little bit. So, uh, I throw this um, out there. I'm going to let you look at that. See if uh, it makes sense. Sometimes we have... Um, something has become so, um, we see it so often that it uh, becomes normal and it really isn't normal. So just without any more explanation, go on to the next slide. So at this point, I wanna just shift gears, uh, move away from that trauma. We know that, um, that what happens in our life impacts uh, us as we move forward and um, it affects how we select food and how we um, make choices. And so at this point, um, it really when we were writing this lesson, we wanted to get away from um, the concept that um, as nutrition, people who work in nutrition we and in education, that we know what we need to be eating and that's what we preach and that's what we talk about and we know we need to eat um, the something from all the food groups but um, a trauma-informed nutrition security takes it deeper and it's saying that 
there's a whole lot more that goes into food selection. And when we're working with families, especially in food pantries, that we need to kind of stop um, before we um, pass judgment and realize um, what people choose is more complicated. And we all want to eat healthy and we, we all want to be healthy. Um, and it's not necessarily that we don't know what we need to eat, but um, going back to our childhood, there may be some things that happened that have impacted, and or maybe it's going on right now that has that impacts of the selection of food that we take. So um, dietary behaviors and trauma. I want you to think about um, when you're under stress. How do you react? Um, how do you eat? What are the things that you choose to eat when you are under stress? I know I don't always choose the healthiest things. And I think um, I crave uh, things that are sweet, things that are salty, maybe things that are higher in fat. If I'm under stress, I may um, not, uh, I may grab the things that are closest to me. So um, the, I don't want to, um, I don't want to imply that um, my, when I'm under stress, it's the same thing as um, being, uh, having trauma in the past. So, um, uh, because that is a lot more complicated. Um, but I mean, I, to help us understand this a little bit better, I think uh, if we can think back on when we're under stress, it, uh, it affects um, the selections that we make. So here's a few other um, things that impact our choices. Obviously, biological. I mean, we eat when we're hungry. Our appetite sometimes dictates that. Um, our taste, uh, things that we prefer. Um, obviously, some of those are um, tastes is often... Um, uh, established when we were younger. So um, that can go back to our childhood. Uh, obviously, economics, um, if we have enough money to buy the food that we want, uh, I often hear um, families say, I, I can't afford some of the healthier foods like uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, higher quality proteins. And so that can have, um, that can impact the choices that we make. There's also um, some of the physical things. Is there access in my neighborhood to buy um, a fresh fruits and vegetables? Um, do I know how to use some of those things? Do I have the skills? Do I have the time? And I want to um, just stop right here a second. A lot of times what I hear, um, especially family uh, volunteers working in pantry saying, you know, um, Families just don't know what to do. They don't have the skills. They don't have the knowledge of what to do, uh, how to cook. And um, I think the value of this, uh, what I'm talking about today is to say, hey, hold on a second. Um, I think we do. I think a lot of people do know what they need to eat, but uh, it could be more complicated um, like not having access, uh, our time, um, uh, it's, we often grab processed foods because it's quick. And if you're working a couple jobs, you know, there's reasons why uh, you don't have time to fix a, a extended meal. So for um, food pantries or family, uh, for volunteers working in the field, I think we need to be, not be so quick to judge on this. Um, obviously there's social determinants that affect our food choices. You can see those class culture, some of the social things that we learned, um, psychological, our, our moods, just I, I mentioned um, being under stress, um, what mood we're in, if we've had a really hard day um, or maybe we're even happy. So let's take it to the positive. Um, you know, we reward ourselves with something um, because something good has happened. Uh, we eat something and we feel guilty. So um, our mood and uh, eating is very psychological. And then we have ingrained attitudes, beliefs, and some um, 
knowledge about food that is passed down to us through our families, um, through our grandparents, um, through our peers at school. Um, so I started talking about this earlier, but um, when trauma happens, um, it can affect our behaviors. And I started talking about um, foster care. Um, I had worked with some children and during summer that I mean, quite a few of them had been foster care. And we found that they were taking excess food and, and either hiding it or um, saving it for later um, to take home. So um, when you think back to that, um, the one slide that if you don't have enough, especially when you're young. And I will even go back. I knew my father-in-law who grew up in, during the depression talked about hoarding food. So if um, trauma impacts go, can go way back. And um, so if you don't have enough, you may do things like hoarding it or when you finally get it, um, binge on it and uh, or compulsively overeat. And um, uh, if you study um, some cultures where uh, they uh, had to go out and kill an animal and they didn't have the means to preserve it, um, people feasted on that. Let's say, um, let's say it's a large deer. You feasted on that, and then you might go a while without having it. So, some some of these things are ingrained. Um, go back to our childhood. So I mentioned, um, like for myself, uh, I crave when I'm stressed, I often crave some of these things like sweet, uh, high fat, salty things uh, to kind of help me get through things. Um, uh, families who are have experienced trauma uh, may rely more heavily on convenience foods. And it's not to say that they don't always have the skills for cooking. That may be the reason, but um, it may be that they're multi working multiple jobs, or it may be that um, they are depressed and they just are not um, have don't have the energy to do much cooking, and so they rely very heavily on some convenience foods. Um, Eating disorders or food addictions are another way that trauma um, impacts behavior. Uh, decision making, um, you know, I've heard um, often when we're teaching, like uh, have a budget, have a menu, have a budget, and um, have a plan for the week, which uh, on paper sounds really good. But uh, for some families um, who are living day to day um, and working multiple jobs or suffering from um, some uh, issue, uh, emotional issues, you know, they're living in short term and not able to uh, think long term. And uh, I've heard sometimes that um, the SNAP benefits did not last until the end of the month. And, and if you think about this, you know, um, and going even to uh, eating because you know you've, you've got it right now and you don't know if you're going to have it later, so enjoy it now. It might mean that you might not have food at the end of the month. So also, that, oops, um, I don't really go back, but it, the point that we um, planning is hard. So um, as I move forward, I'm just going to suggest um, six different ways to address um, food-informed nutrition. And the first one is to think um, safety and security. So for food pantries or anybody working in the field of feeding people, um, making sure that their space is feels safe to the families coming in. Um, uh, that might mean uh, how you set up a room. It might be the way you communicate to people, um, how you move people through it, uh, some pantries, some food um, soup kitchens may make you stand in line uh, or they may open up a room where people can sit and be um, relaxed and welcome. Uh, so 
um, if you're working in this field, think about that security and that safety piece and what um, safety means to one person may not be safety to another. What we think as a safe space um, may not be safe to everybody. And sometimes we just need to ask what that would look like for them. Trustworthiness and transparency. Um, sometimes we have to make changes in how we do, um, how we welcome people, how we serve people. And I'm thinking of how food pantries had to shift during COVID. Um, I think about it. Um, many volunteers at food pantries were seniors. And so sometimes pantries had to shut down and couldn't be open because of the lack of volunteers or uh, maybe had to reduce their hours because they had fewer, fewer people. So letting people know why the doors are shut or why you have uh, changes in rules um, and being as transparent as you can. Um, some food pantries have adapted, have adopted um, nutrition policies and um, conveying that information to the people they serve is really important. So they understand why um, those policies are in place and, and um, a good policy would always say that um, it's for the health of the people that we serve, that we want, um, want the families that we serve to have some healthy options. So being transparent is important. Uh, obviously being aware of some of the cultural, or historic, or gender issues going on. I think this is, uh, especially if you have volunteers that um, are older, they may not be as up to speed on some of these things. And I think about, um, you know, it may be uncomfortable to, uh, and um, help, helping them understand that um, their way is not always the only way or the right way, um, that we are a big world and um, we are changing all the time. And um, our culture is not, our personal culture is not the only way. And so um, uh, having some conversation with um, some of the older people that we're working on, it's not just older people too, but um, realizing stereotypes um, are out there and sometimes we need to address those as we um, work with families. Uh, I'm big on this part, um, uh, sharing, sharing power. Um, it's not that I have power to share, but um, realizing that um, everyone has a voice and um, we need to listen to that, especially as we are out in the community to realize um, a lot of times we need to shift and we need to um, make sure that we're listening to what the needs are of the people. Um, they know best what they need and we can't assume. So giving people voice and choice. And um, in the past, food pantries and a lot of... Um, people that are serving, a lot of us uh, programs that have been serving other people in the community uh, think we know what's best. And so um, we would put boxes of food together and give to people, but um, that's assuming everybody's gonna go home and um, make pancakes every month. And um, so I remember when I first started volunteering at a pantry, everybody was getting pancakes or pancake mix and pancake syrup every month but and not everybody needs that so giving a box of food um, kind of takes that choice away from people and I think pantries have realized in recent years that when you give people choice um, they take what they need and leave what they don't need and um, we need to be more in tune to that uh, as as we move forward. And then collaboration and mutuality, it kind of builds on that, is that um, one of the things I encourage uh, groups that are serving um, food 
are doing food assistance, uh, make sure that you have somebody um, that you're you're checking in with the people that you're serving. Um, are any of them serving on your board? Is there a way that um, conversation is going um, both directions? And uh, when you can, um, uh, it's great to have somebody with lived experience so that peer support piece, um, having volunteers who understand, who maybe walked in the same shoes, uh, sharing those stories, or and helping each other and mentoring each other. And that could look different in different places, but in a food pantry, it may be having um, uh, volunteers that, that have had shared experience uh, with the uh, families and individuals you're serving. So with that, I'm gonna just briefly mention, um, talk a little bit about customer service and um, and this kind of applies to all of us. You can see a picture of uh, food right there, but um, customer service looks different. Um, can look different, but really uh, doesn't have to be. And um, I think one of the takeaways in the when I taught this lesson is that um, we need to put our judgments aside as we are working with families um, and um I'm really big on pushing fruits and vegetables, um, but um, I also need to realize there are reasons why people don't choose those. Uh, they may not be familiar with some of them, and that may just be a conversation on um, how to use some of them or, or talk about that. Um, the other thing is we need to be careful not to um, use shame. Um, families that come to seek out assistance for food, uh, may be feeling guilty already, may, may be feeling like um, they're being judged. Um, I have been in food pantries where there has been, uh, or some of the staff have been rather judgmental. And if I were the person going and receiving food, I wouldn't go back. I would look for another place. So, um, and um, going back to children um, and their lunch program, you know, they know they've been um, observed by their friends in the past. And there's that. Um, I, I don't like that feeling of people knowing that I'm going to the pantry. So that fear of public exposure. And for some people, going to the pantry really is their at last resort. Um, going back to COVID. Uh, you saw the big number that 53 million, um, there were people that, during that year and there are still people that um, families that have had to resort to food pantries that never had for whatever reason. And my, um, my takeaway on all this is we don't know. We can look at that iceberg and we only see a little bit and we might assume that person hasn't been working, but they may be working two or three jobs or just lost a great job. So um, putting that judgment aside is probably one of the biggest things we can do for um, um, serving individuals. And, and all of this, is, um, you know, creating a welcoming environment. I mean, you don't have to be in a food pantry to do this. Um, wherever you work, um, you know, using smile and, and um, eye contact, we can tell when somebody, um, we don't feel welcomed. And you think about some of the spaces that you've been in and body language says a lot, um, but having eye contact uh, and looking up from the, our paperwork and acknowledging the person that's there and, and, and giving even just a small smile can mean a lot. I uh, make conversation, um, trying to connect with somebody on the, even the littlest thing, um, you know, maybe a child that's with them and, you know, acknowledging that child. Uh, one of the food pantries that I go to keeps um, um, a box of children's books behind the uh, behind the desk. And so she'll offer some children's books. She's a retired teacher and she, this one volunteer just tried, would try to connect with the family on that personal level. And of course we know our, our tone of voice. You've um, probably picked up the phone one or 
two times before and, and got a gruff uh, person on the other line. And maybe um, it may be a friend that you called or it may be a business. And, and you know, um, our tone of voice has impact. And then the last one, using inclusive language. Um, again, uh, you. this is a little... Um, for older people, this is new and sometimes changing, and we may uh, not know all of this. Um, the slide that I have here is from Northwestern uh, University. It's, I think, a couple years old. And I think um, it kind of depends where you live. Uh, you can see some of the terms that have been used in the past that are, can be offensive and some options over to the side that are uh, more acceptable, but uh, depending on your community, um, there may be terms that are even better. And uh, one thing I like to say, if you don't know, um, ask. And I think sometimes with gender, we, you don't know. And instead of um, uh, putting your foot in your mouth, which we maybe, maybe you've done, I know I've done it, um, it's better to ask and um, what uh, pronoun person prefers or uh, if they had a child who has uh, mental health issues asking you know what term they prefer. So these are just some examples that are out there. Uh, so just a few more things um, on customer service um, and promoting uh, dignity. And, and these are aimed at food pantries, but um, there might it might cross the line to some of the other work that you do. Uh, not turning people away because of boundaries. Um, going back to being ashamed of going to uh, the food stamp office. You know, uh, you people may want to go to another neighborhood, another food pantry, so their neighbors don't see them. There may so um, eliminating boundaries is a good thing. Uh, instead of calling your facility your food assistance facility at pantry, maybe using the term market. And um, Northern Illinois Food Bank does that with their uh, market that they have uh, on the south end of Rockford. They call it a market instead of the pantry. Doing whatever you can um, to have make your envir physical environment more friendly and less sterile um, could be challenging, but can make a difference. Uh, more grocery, more pantries, our markets are going toward uh, a choice option. And so where families get to walk through and make choices. And you can see the shelves there, um, almost grocery store style. Um, and we know food can be, um, we all have cultural preferences. And so finding out um, what those preferences are with the families we serve is really important. Obviously, using our body language and not folding our arms, or um, you know, having a um, a Superman or a um, power stands, but um, more humbling um, stands uh, is more is received a little bit better. Uh, obviously, withholding judgment in our conversations, and um, and then using healthy nudges. Um, in the snap ed world, we liked um, the idea of um, quietly saying, you know, how about, what would you think about grabbing a couple of vegetables? What, um, having some messaging on the shelves that encourage people to take some of those healthy options. Oops. So with that um, brief presentation, I talked a little bit about trauma. I talked about um, what trauma-informed nutrition security is. Uh, talked a little bit about food dignity and gave you a few ideas on um, strategies for uh, promoting food dignity. And I'll just briefly show my references. So I was telling Danielle, I, I prefer to teach in public face-to-face uh, -face because I can read the faces of the people I'm um, interacting with. Um, I don't feel like this is so interactive. So uh, at this point, um, if anybody's got questions, I'd really love to hear 
um, here's some any questions you might have um, or any suggestions uh, that you might have. Yeah, if you're, anyone's able to, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A feature and we can read through them. Or if you want to raise your hand, I think I can allow you to talk as well. However you prefer. And thank you, Carol. Yeah. That was great. My contact information is there. Um, best way to reach me is um, through my email. Uh, I am in uh, Rockford, uh, but I do serve uh, Winnebago, Stevenson, and Joe Davies. And we have uh, I have co there's we have coworkers around the state. So if you serve in another part of the state, um, we gladly work with you. We've got to thank you. Um, Regina, I'm going to let you talk really quick, OK? Oh, hold on. Where did she go? OK. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, thank uh, you. How you doing, Miss Carol? I'm um, good. I think it's some great information, what you were sharing, just being aware and interacting with the people that we're serving when they do have to go to the pantry and things of that nature and just being able to identify, you know, different things of what they're dealing with and um, allow them to be receptive to your communication with them. Thanks, Regina. Um, yeah, you know, I, 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 nutrition is a field where uh, we get crammed our brains get crammed with a lot of what you should do, what's healthy, and um, we tend to spew all that out and not sit and listen, and not um, we think we know everything and we don't. And mm -hmm. um, I I see um, the comment about can openers, and I know pantries of um, number of pantries will ask some of that. You do have the means, uh, especially when we know we there are family or individuals coming in that are homeless. You know, what what do you need? And that's where offering choice and letting families or individuals go through and choose what they know they can use. Uh, and of course, if you don't have um, a can opener, uh, you're limited on some of the things that you can grab. And you don't have means to cook. If you're, um, I, I was camping over the weekend and I observed a family that I'm pretty sure was living in the campground because it was cheaper than rent. So you don't know. We don't know, only see the top of the iceberg sometimes. Um, I want to read some, man, some really great questions. Um, hello, Carol, would you suggest more veg, veggies and white meat as you get older? Um, uh, yes, but, um, and, and we've kind of gotten away from always saying it has to be fresh. So canned vegetables, if that's what you can afford and what you have that's a whole lot better than uh, not having fresh um, white meat. I, I, you know, I, um, I used to be a vegetarian and I, there are people out there that are vegetarian. So I'm um, a little more sensitive about the protein piece. It, you know, whatever people want to eat, it would, it might be familiarity and they're used to eating, um, red meat more often so um, is white meat healthier possibly so uh, yeah it can just depends who and where you, where you're at thanks for asking that danielle um oh i like the idea of grouping things as um total meals we're trying to do that in some of our pantries is suggesting especially when there's something they don't quite know what to do with um putting that um, putting those things together thinking as a um a bundle. Oh, how can you help uh, encourage someone who is scared to use 
food banks or services to use them. Yeah. Um, you, you know, um, one of the things you can do is offer um, the list to them or give them um, suggestions where they can go. Um, sometimes it may be saying, do you need help getting there? Um, it is a hard first step. And I can think of family members that um, did not want to take it, but were glad once they finally did. Um, if, if you can accompany them, that might make it a little bit easier. Um, the uh, community market that Northern Illinois Food Bank uh, has down on uh, the south side of Rockford, anybody can go in and it's grocery store style. Um, so not a lot of questions asked. That's an easier option. Danielle, am I missing? Are there any questions you see there that you want to read to me? Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, that would be great if you'd give them to me. For sure. Um, so you have another thank you. I like to see food markets that are set up like grocery stores. It gives a sense of choice and adds dignity. Um, I think Heidi was mentioning back to the, I think, can opener. Um, yeah. Often women and children in human trafficking and domestic violence situations are living in shelters and don't have these things. Um, do you find that pantries that allow their clients to choose and shop for their own meals have far less food waste? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I've been to food pantries and you walk outside and the pantries that don't have choice, you'll see some stuff in the garbage or just sitting outside. Um, some pantries will have like a shared table, like what schools are doing now. Um, so if you can't use it, put it back on the, put it on the table and let somebody else take it. So um, yeah, food bank, Northern Illinois Food Bank is the food bank that works with uh, most of the pantries in our area. And they um, at one point had a, um, they were telling all pantries if they were gonna participate, they had to have a choice, meaning set up as a grocery store and uh, then COVID hit and pantries, have, many pantries have not gone back to that. So, but it does provide dignity when people can choose. Thank you. Um, we have one more. It says, I've been seeing recipe cards at the pantries to help people figure out what to cook and how to cook it. Are there any resources to teach healthy cooking techniques? Yeah, and that's something our SNAP-Ed staff can do. We um, are gradually moving back into food pantries now and doing um, uh, just uh, booths where we can talk about uh, an issue or not an issue, but a topic and then um, can talk about how to use some of the things that are there. We do try to put recipes out in the food pantries, even if we can't be there. Well, and I'm, could you read Heidi's last one? Thank you for Emily and yes. Kathy. Um, those are apprehensive about going sometimes going to the food pantry pop-ups are less uncomfortable because they don't have to provide as much information about themselves and the workers bring it right to their car. This is great for families and seniors. Good point. Good point. Yeah, I love that point. Um, there is one coming up this week on Wednesday at four o'clock at Key Mall Quest. It's a, I think it's a drive-through. So if you know anybody that needs food that, um, and also and when you do that, those pop-ups, no questions asked. That is an easy option. But also, if it's box, you're getting, you know, there's, uh, you're getting what they give you. So um, what I always say to families is if you can't use it, share it with somebody, don't throw it away. And thank you for all those questions and great comments. Um, please reach out. Uh, I recognize the number of the names in the audience. Uh, reach out um, if you want, ever want assistance. Um, our nutrition education, we have um, three new community workers that are looking for um, ways to get out in the community. And we've got curriculum, research-based curriculum, um, and would love to come out um, to some of your sites. And we are working in some of the mental health uh, um, services too. So 
if it makes sense, um, reach out. Thank you so much. Um, Carol, would you mind if I followed up with everyone with a copy of your PowerPoint? Yes, it would be fine. Okay, yeah. awesome. Well, thank you. And thank everyone for joining us today. I hope everyone has a good afternoon. Bye. Bye.